I'm Cynthia Raleigh. I'm an author and I write the Perry Seymour genealogical mystery series as well as the Lantern Ordinary Witches series. The first book of which is Summoning the Winds. I'm going to um, read through a talk that I gave to a local history group in August of 2020 which mainly is going to concern witchcraft in colonial America. But I'm gonna start with talking about uh, Summoning the Winds and why I decided to write that. Uh, Summoning the Winds developed over quite a few years. I was the kid who was always wanting to be a witch for Halloween uh, or Samhain as it was known by the Celts. Samhain is still my favorite holiday, and it's in my favorite time of year. Samhain marked the end of the harvest, and it fell midway between the autumn equinox and the winter solstice. Uh, at that time, the fires in the home hearths were extinguished or allowed to go out while they went out and got in their final harvest. And once the work was done, uh, a community fire was built and each household took a flame from that fire and carefully transported it home to relight the fire in their own hearth and that helped to bond the community together for the coming year. Now while we recognize that tradition as symbolic glue that would hold the village together, it's something that would have been considered witchcraft during the settling of the colonies in America. Um, these things captured my attention, and I read every book that I could find in the library about it. I never lost my fascination with the witches and the witch punts. Um, as I grew up, I read Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, Arthur Miller's The Crucible. I read about the English witch hunts and the Salem witch trials. I watched every movie that I could find. I was a big fan of the Wicked Witch of the West. She was intriguing to me. She was a bad egg, definitely, but she had powers and powers to do things no one else could, even though she used them for, for bad. So um, I also liked her clothing, I have to admit. Uh, aside from that, witches and the women accused of being witches through literature, movies, and history have that allure of independence the mystique of a woman who's doing the things that she wants to do in life. Uh, they were infinitely more captivating to me than the sorts of things that I was expected to be interested in. When I was 16, my family took a family vacation to Boston. And while I loved the history of that old city, the shining star for me was Salem. I vividly remember touring the House of the Seven Gables and I was thrilled by the hidden staircase uh, behind the china hutch in the dining area, as well as a hidden access panel in an upstairs bedroom. And by the way, the cover of Summoning the Winds uses a photograph of the House of the Seven Gables that my 16-year-old self took way back when with my little Kodak Instamatic camera with the flash bulbs that you had to stick into the top. I also got to tour the witch house. That was the home of Jonathan Corwin, who was one of the judges in the Salem Witch Trials. It's the only uh, building that remains standing that was directly involved with someone who was in the, involved in the trials at the time. So over the years, I've thought about all these women, uh, those that were accused of being witches, dragged through the streets, publicly shamed, tortured, and if not executed, their life and livelihoods were just ruined. So of, of those that were accused, none of them were actual witches, and certainly not the type that they were accused of being. So I got to thinking about that, and I wondered, what if, what if one of those women had truly been the type of sorceress that the colonists were scared of? You know, what if Sarah Good or Ann Hibbins or Elizabeth Proctor could do the things that she was accused of doing? Well, she, she wouldn't have been so easy to capture or to torture or to execute. 
Um, I really wanted to write this book, took a break from the, the genealogical mysteries to answer this call that I always had wanting to draw attention to the plight that these women suffered through at the time. So the story in Summoning the Winds centers on a fictional village called Millthorpe in 1660, Connecticut. Now my protagonist is a 20 year old woman named Yarrow Pickering, who with her younger sister Tansy, was brought to the New World by their parents several years before the story takes place. Their father built and ran the village ordinary, and that's a contemporary word for a pub in combination. Their mother was a skilled herbal woman and a midwife. The name Yarrow Pickering was something I woke up with in my head one morning. When that happens, I listen. What I didn't realize until after the book was already published was that at 23 Congress Street in Salem, there is what is known as Pickering Wharf Marina. So my subconscious may have known that, but I prefer to think that it was Yarrow urging me on as my muse. So after the death of both of their parents, Yarrow takes over caring for her sister and running the ordinary, as well as serving as the village herbal woman in place of her mother. Uh, she's taking on the roles of both her father and her mother. A, a villager who is adept with remedies or physics as herbal women um, were called physicers, they were called at the time, was an essential part of colonial life. Uh, they didn't have doctors, they didn't have doctor's offices, there was nowhere to go to buy medicines. You had to rely on someone who, who knew what they were doing. Um, ordinaries served not only as places to get a meal and a drink and to socialize, but also provided a room for travelers to overnight in. Uh, usually there, was a, there were one, two, or maybe more rooms available, not many. Um, a lot of ordinaries also had a, a large common room, generally on the upper level if there was one, that could serve as a meeting place. Uh, kind of like what a conference room is today. This room was often also used for the body examinations that accused women were subjected to in search of witches' marks. Local women would be recruited to do the exam and report the findings to the magistrate. Uh, it would be unusual for a young woman to be in charge of an ordinary, but it wasn't unheard of for a female to take over a family vocation or farm if one or both parents or her spouse were to die. Women were considered fit to understand business, much less to conduct it. However, there was a reason that this sometimes was the case. If one or more members of a family were left orphaned or widowed and had no means of support, each village was responsible for their upkeep, including housing, food, firewood, clothing, necessities. In a continuance of the poor rate in England, the villagers all paid into a common fund that was for relief of the poor. If a woman was able to continue her husband's or her father's trade, such as running an ordinary, the village would allow it since it removed the burden of support from the village. And in the 17th century, even the late 17th century, villages were still struggling just to survive through the winter. So the desire not to have a woman run a business had to defer to taking the burden off the village. So in a time when witch hunts were on the uptick in the book, Yarrow desperately needs to conceal that she's a true witch. And so is her sister Tansy, although they have somewhat different talents. They are hereditary witches. Their Welsh mother uh, comes from a long line of cunning women. And cunning women were the equivalent of uh, the village wise woman, a shaman, midwife, seeress, physiker, as well as the go-to woman for love, revenge, or protection spells. Uh, when things in the village begin to go awry and fingers start pointing, it becomes increasingly difficult for Yarrow to keep her secret. 
like many of the women from history that we only know of because they were accused of witchcraft, she has a streak of independence and she has outspokenness that she just isn't totally able to suppress as the conditions deteriorate in Millthorpe. Injustice and cruelty are intolerable to her and basically she just cannot keep her mouth shut in the face of that kind of fight for the underdog. So I wrote this book for several purposes. Uh, it's a supernatural fiction that I hope is entertaining and brings enjoyment to the reader. It's a historic fiction, which serves as my tribute to the women, not only of the colonies, but every other place where women were ruthlessly persecuted and died for nothing. It's also in recognition and honor of Native American spirituality and the similarities that do exist between their beliefs and that of the cunning woman. Okay, so that's the book. So let's now take a look at what women faced in the colonies. Life was hard for everyone, there is no doubt about that. Uh, for the women who crossed the Atlantic, restrictive expectations were in place for everything from their clothing to their demeanor, their words, and even their thoughts. Some women who did the crossing didn't complete it without drawing suspicion from the crew and or the passengers, and at least four women we know of were executed on board on their way to the New World. In comparing what women were accused of doing versus what women were actually doing in colonial America, there isn't too much of an overlap. The rigid demands of the Puritan religion aided the stranglehold that the witch craze placed on them. While it's well meant, their doctrine could be very self-defeating. Everyone was expected to adhere rigidly to the scriptures at all times throughout their lives. And even doing so, the status of their immortal soul, they believed, could never be assured, and it just required constant vigilance throughout their entire lives. In a 1653 sermon, New Haven clergyman John Davenport said, quote, a forward discontented frame of spirit was a good subject fit for the devil to work upon, end quote. Discontent was used to mean feeling one belonged in a higher place in the social order than where they actually were. This is a form of that most dangerous trait, pride. It was believed to affect mainly women since they were considered to be often displeased with their material conditions, uh, status in society, and this naturally drew them to Satan where they thought they could secure property and leisure um, one lady was named Elizabeth Godman. She was a woman from a wealthy family, but she had neither brothers nor sons, although she was an inheritor of a substantial estate. She was described by author Carol Carlson, that is K-A-R-L-S-E-N, as being in the category of women who stood in the way of the orderly transmission of property from one generation of males to another. As a mere woman, her money and estate were turned over to the then deputy governor of New Haven, Stephen Goodyear, and she lived in his household, abiding by his rules. Elizabeth was forced to ask for, even beg at times, for everything she needed, even though the money was her own. It isn't hard to see how this caused Elizabeth to be discontent, but due to injustice rather than pride. Elizabeth was accused of being a witch. Goodyear remarked that he had seen her, quote, fling herself out of a room, end quote, following a reading from the Bible. He reported her as saying it was because she liked it not, but said it was against her. Echoing Davenport's words, William Hook said that after Elizabeth had begged beer from him, Godman had walked away in a muttering, discontented manner because it had not been newly drawn beer. Elizabeth was credited with a wide variety of actions, including sexual relations with the devil, causing miscarriages, possessing knowledge she couldn't possibly have any other way. Her mischief didn't stop there. Elizabeth enchanted people, cattle, and chickens, spoiled butter making, and soured beer. 
She endured two court hearings after which, uh, sounding very disappointed, the court stated, quote, the evidence is not sufficient to take away your life, end quote. So her movements within the community were instead just severely restricted and she was ordered to pay 50 pounds for surety toward her good behavior, kind of like paying bond uh, when you're bailed out of jail to ensure that you will come back for the trial. I didn't say who that 50 pounds went to, but I think we can probably make a good guess at that. So Elizabeth Godman had been well healed but prior to 1656, most accused women were of the poorer class, and they shared some similar, familiar common factors, such as being single, widowed, or just disagreeable scolds. But there were other situations that could make a woman more vulnerable. Ladies with a quirky, eccentric, or outspoken nature were usually the first to be criticized. Women who used their skills to supplement their family income, whether by making medicines, soap, or weaving, were susceptible to accusations since they were viewed as competition to men who engaged in the same vocations. Herbal women were highly important, but often targets for accusations. Uh, villagers had few reservations about seeking remedies from the local herbalist. They even learned to make some of their own, but her knowledge put her in danger. Many plants used in physics could be lethal and experience was necessary to handle and use them. For instance, a form of nightshade, belladonna, was used for its sedative properties as well as for respiratory and digestive ailments. Arnica is useful for external aches and pains, but it's easily poisonous if taken internally. The American mandrake, which many of us will know as mayapple, is highly caustic and the roots are poisonous. But the mayapple is now a source of podophyllin, which is used in preparations for wart removal as well as in some cancer treatments. It often didn't take much for a woman who grew or gathered these types of plants to be accused of using that knowledge to sicken or kill her fellow villagers. And a reason could always be found why she might do that. Also, particularly at risk were midwives. They are essential members of every community, but what made them important made them vulnerable. Childbirth was uncertain at best, and the Puritans still believed that stillborn children and those who died very early were doomed to hell. The loss of a child is a tragedy, and it was complicated by the family having to live with the thought of their baby going to hell. A less than well-liked midwife, a neighbor perceived as jealous, or someone with an outspoken attitude, could become the focus of a couple who lost a baby, and especially if there was an ax to grind between them. The other side of the coin wasn't much of an improvement. If a midwife successfully managed a difficult birth, it might create suspicion she was a witch because the birth was unlikely to have gone well without supernatural help. So she was basically damned if she did and damned if she didn't. The work a Puritan did was viewed as giving praise to God, which also led to seeing the devil in anything that kept their work from prospering or made it more difficult, no matter how mundane. A broken wagon wheel or a a bunch of wool roving that was difficult to spin might be perceived as sorcery by an idle or vengeful woman in the neighborhood. The ways a woman could attract unwelcome attention to herself were legion and it must have been absolutely exhausting trying to avoid them. Another pitfall was disbelief in witchcraft and the poor soul who expressed doubt put him or herself at risk of joining the accused on the stand and this did happen. A person who associated with, lived nearby, defended, or questioned the proceedings in the trial of a witch could draw suspicion upon themselves as being in league with the devil. In 1653, Mary Staples was accused as a witch by Roger Ludlow because she would not readily accept the decision of the New Haven, Connecticut court that her neighbor, Goody Knapp, was a witch. Goody Knapp was tried and executed. Not helping her situation, Mary Staples said she wasn't satisfied that there were any witches at all. Mary was accused again, along with her daughter, Mary Harvey, 
during the witch hunts of 1692, but neither of them were convicted. Once a woman was accused, she was often subjected to some pretty humiliating things. Active torture, meaning the use of implements to elicit a confession, torture devices, that occurred mainly in Britain and Europe. Uh, the women in the colonies tended to be uh, persuaded by methods. And I'm gonna make a, a quick departure from the colonies right here because I wanna relate the story of a woman executed as a witch during the same time period, uh, 1670, in Norway. This is just for comparison's sake. And this story was told to me by a friend of mine who lives in Norway. Her name is Aud Waldvik. Um, this story is about Elizabeth Peter's daughter. She was born in Kulgrenstad, Hulanda, which is about 40 miles southwest of Trondheim in Norway. Lisbeth, as she was called, married Ole Nupen sometime in the first half of the 1600s. There are no documents that give us even the year. So that's really the best guess of when they would have been married because by 1670, Elizabeth was 60 and her husband Ole was about 67. Elizabeth was a healer and herbal woman and she served her village for many years. One of her methods for healing was an old folk remedy called reading the salt. She re would recite a prayer over a measure of salt, uh, which the sick person then ate. And I, I didn't see any details as to whether they ate it right then or if they took it home with them and ate it in their food, but they did consume it after she uh, prayed over it. So in 1670, someone began spreading rumors that Elizabeth was a witch. The Nupans brought a slander suit against the plaintiff. Elizabeth, charged for her services, as one does when making a living. Uh, the plaintiff complained that Lisbeth used witchcraft to sicken people so that she could then make money from selling them the cure or performing a healing for them. Ola Nupen, her husband, didn't help the situation since he had previously been known to boast about his wife's abilities, saying no one would argue with them or mess with them because of her abilities. Uh, there were many witnesses who testified for Lisbeth. They said that they had recovered after her treatments and that they were fine. She had never done them any harm and they had never known her to do harm, but this didn't help her cause and it may have actually worked against her. She testified in her own behalf that she did pray when she did healings, but that she used the name of God in her healing. That too was spun around by the court officials and they suggested that Lisbeth used the prayers to ask for help from Satan, not God. That's really stretching it. I, I don't know. I don't know where they got that, but they, they came up with that. So both Lisbeth and her husband were arrested on charges of witchcraft. Ole Minson, the parish priest, tried his best to get Lisbeth and Ole to confess, but they wouldn't. The couple was tortured and according to reports, it was severe. The, the torture was very vigorous, but the couple remained resolute in their innocence. Now, the court decided that their obstinate refusal to confess was contempt of court and that Lisbeth could not give the right confession because she was so closely aligned with the devil. Both were convicted of witchcraft. Since Lisbeth was clearly more guilty than Ole, her sentence was to be burned alive at the stake. Ola received death sentence, uh, his death sentence was to be by beheading as a consolation prize for not being the actual witch, but only tolerating it. So in September of 1670, 350 years ago, this month of September 2020, the executions were carried out. Lisbeth Peter's daughter Nupen was the second to the last woman to be burnt as a witch in Norway. There is a statue of her on the grounds of a school in Leinstrand, Norway, and a road in Katem, which is part of the city of Trondheim, and it is named after her. So torture, followed by burning at the stake, was more the norm for Europe. 
and in the colonies, women were subjected to methods of persuasion such as degradation, squalid conditions, lack of care, and purposeful deprivation of sleep. Juries of women, 12 if they could manage it, were chosen to take the accused to a private place for examination. The woman would be stripped of her clothing and examined in humiliating minute detail. Every inch of her body was scrutinized in the search for teats or witches marks. Any flaw could be considered proof, but those even remotely shaped like an animal were immediately seized upon as clear evidence of witchcraft. The genital area was the favored spot to find these indications of guilt and teats were believed to be nipples that were used to feed the witch's blood to her imps and familiars, which were gifts from Satan to her to do her bidding. And my favorite familiar name has to be Pie Wacket, which was one of um, the familiars named in during a confession in the eastern portion of England at the as a result of Matthew Hopkins, the Witchfinder General, um, torture that he performed. Women can. The particular woman who named Pie Wacket as one of her familiars came up with a lot of names. The Vinegar Tom was another one. Um, another one was Sack and Sugar, I think. There were, there were several. I can't remember them all. So those were teats. Now, witches' marks were considered brands that were placed on the woman by the devil himself through licking or touching her skin. There are a few people who have absolutely no moles or scars or birthmarks or any kind of discoloration on their body somewhere. So most examinations found what they were looking for. Sometimes the woman was forcibly exposed in court to provide visible, visible evidence of her covenant with the devil. With a blind eye to the irony, colonists sometimes use homespun versions of what would be considered witchcraft in others uh, to protect themselves and their homes from evil spirits. During repairs in a colonial home in Westport, Massachusetts, a cache of 20 shoes were found concealed in the space behind the rear wall of a fireplace. And shoes are, they're not found all the time, but they're not uncommon either in colonial America, although there are far fewer as in Europe and Britain where they were far um, more often used for protection. And sometimes different sizes of shoes would be used in, they think maybe it was thought that the different sizes would protect the different ages of the people within the home. Uh, other than that, another example of protections used by the colonists was revealed uh, in the 1979 discovery of a witch bottle next to the foundation of a 17th century house in the Great Neck area of Virginia Beach. The slender, clear glass bottle was buried upside down. It contained pins and nails and was sealed with a cork, which was still in place. <clears throat> Witch bottles often contained urine, hair, and nail clippings from the person who suspected that they were bewitched. This was thought to draw the witch to the bottle. The witch was thought to be drawn to the hair nail clippings, urine, whatever, of, of that person whom they had it out for. And then once she was in the bottle, the, the iron of the nails and the pins would bind her and trap her within the bottle and cause either severe illness or the death of a witch. So sometimes if someone died soon after the witch bottle was buried, even if they didn't even know the person, they would sometimes be considered to have been the witch because they died as a result of the witch bottle. Uh, accounts of this particular bottle suggest it could have been used against Grace Sherwood, uh, who was a woman frequently pulled into court on charges of witchcraft between 1698 and 1706. Uh, one of those many accusations against her was that she tormented a female neighbor during the night, then escaped through the keyhole in the shape of a black cat, which would be a very handy talent to have. Grace was the only woman in Virginia to be convicted as a witch through trial by water. 
when Grace was accused of as a witch by neighbors, she and her husband James sued them for slander. But the death of her husband in 1701 left Grace alone to fend off the accusations. And Grace did have repeated dust-ups with neighbors Luke and Elizabeth Hill. After another string of court appearances, a long string of them, where the couple accused Grace of witchcraft, she was ordered to submit to her body being searched for witch marks by a jury of 12 women. Now the forewoman of this group was Elizabeth Barnes, who previously had been sued by the Sherwoods in 1698. So there's a definite um, conflict of interest here. The jury's report stated they found two things like tits with several other spots. With what was considered a guilty verdict, the teats that were found, the Princess Anne County Court batted the case back and forth like a hot potato with the Council of Virginia and the Attorney General who eventually ruled the accusations as too generalized and that the county court was responsible for starting the investigation all over again to arrive at a verdict. And that means even the body examination had to be done over again. Kind of like today, if we had a new trial, everything would have to be redone. The county court decided that Grace was too dangerous to remain free, so she was taken into custody. The constable and sheriff were ordered to search Grace's home and her property as well, including all suspicious places for anything that could be used to strengthen the witchcraft charge. The court also ordered a jury to be assembled, a jury of women, to again search, his, search Grace's body and give anything against her in evidence that they could. The women requested to do so refused this time and failed to appear in court when they were expected. With no actual evidence, no new body search, and complete uncertainty on how to proceed, the flummoxed court decided that ducking was the only way to resolve the verdict. In ducking, also known as swimming or trial by water, a woman was bound and tossed into deep water. If she sank, she was innocent, but guilty if she floated. The premise was that water, considered pure, would reject the devil and repel the witch, whereas it would accept an innocent. So to us, this seems like a remarkably poor way to arrive at a verdict. As a result, uh, drowning was very real. Um, this was not lost on the colonists, but it was a risk they were willing to take. And men were usually provided at the ready to pull the woman out of the water when the test was done, regardless of the result. It wasn't necessarily indicative of the colonists' ignorance, as it's easy for us to assume. When faced with the inability to make a determination based solely on what usually was just coincidence and circumstantial evidence, they saw the water trial as a way of asking God to sort out something that was unprovable by mortal men. And it, it actually also gave them an out if they happened to have made a mistake, which was discovered later on. On uh, July 10th, 1706, Grace was crossbound, her right wrist to her left great toe and her left wrist to her right great toe. The following quoted text, <clears throat> excuse me, following quoted text is from the court order for Grace's trial by water, and it includes the original wording and lack of punctuation. The sheriff shall take all such convenient assistance of boat and men as shall be by him thought fit to meet at Jonathan Harper's plantation in order to take the said Grace forthwith and put her into the above man's depth and try her how she swims therein having care of her life to preserve her from drowning. And as soon as she comes out that he requests as many ancient and knowing women as possible, he can to search her carefully for all teats, spots and marks upon her body, not usual in others. And that as they find the same to make report on oath to the truth thereof to the court. And further it is ordered that some women be requested to shift and search her before she go in the water that she carry nothing about her to cause any further suspicion. So the record doesn't specifically say if Grace floated or sank, but she did survive her swimming. Following the ducking, she was searched, but only by five women because that's all they could find that would do it. 
and they declared on oath, she is not like them nor no other woman that they knew of, having two things like tits on her private parts of a black color, being blacker than the rest of her body. So probably moles, those were probably moles. And you have to figure that they knew that too, but that's, that was their finding. Uh, the court considered this adequate evidence and found her guilty of witchcraft. Grace was ordered to be taken into custody and her body committed to the common jail where she was to be secured by irons. She was imprisoned until 1714 when she was released. She paid her back taxes and returned to her farm where she lived quietly and without further trouble to the age of 80. So Grace Sherwood survived, but not without at least eight years of incarceration. On July 10th, 2006, 300 years to the day, then Virginia Governor Tim Kaine pardoned Grace Sherwood, restoring her good name. A statue of her stands at the intersection of Witch Duck Road and Independence Boulevard in Great Neck. French writer Simone de Beauvoir said, women have been burnt as witches simply because they were beautiful. And that's only one of the reasons for humiliation, torture, and execution of women who had done nothing to speak their mind or get in the way of what someone else wanted. The ability of a community to engage en masse in a witch craze may seem ridiculous to us today, but the mob mentality is never truly far away. Fears of freedom, knowledge, power, or independence held by any demographic can sprout and grow new roots. The witch archetype should serve as a warning to us all. So as for witch hunts, the colonist taste for trials and executions declined rapidly after Salem. It was widely acknowledged by the residents, the judiciary, and the clergy that many innocent people had been killed. Using testimony of the possessed, of uh, dubious confessions and claims of spectral sight were disallowed. And spectral sight was where a person uh, testified in court that they saw an apparition of the person. They would even point to the ceiling and say, I, I see her there now. She's uh, pinching me. And even though no one else could see it, that was actually accepted as evidence in a trial. So they, they disallowed all of that. But without those, there was no basis for a trial. Vestiges do remain in our superstitious protections that we still use. Um, have you ever crossed your fingers? That was said to have initiated from the trying to make the form of a cross to protect yourself. Um, maybe hung an iron or, horseshoe over a door in a U shape. Uh, you were supposed to hang it with the points up because that was to cause um, benevolence and enrichment into your house. If, if you made a mistake and hung it the other way around, that would cause the good luck to flow out of your house. And um, also we still pick four leaf clovers and we press them so we can hang on to them. Four leaf clovers were thought to be uh, protection against evil spirits. So witchcraft and witches still capture the interest of many people today and the occasional accusation or superstition or suspicion may never quite vanish like that cat through the keyhole. So that is my talk on witchcraft in North America. If you're interested in reading Summoning the Winds, I will have a link to it in the comments here at the bottom or in the body of the text underneath this video. Thank you for watching.